Hello and welcome to the number one championship podcast, the second tier. Thank you for joining us wherever you are. I am, of course, Ryan Dilks, and it's time for us to have a stock take of the financial state of the championship. As you will be aware, presumably being a championship fan listening to this, the finance side of the league has a huge bearing on the fortunes of each team. So today we're going to try and cover as many bases as possible with the man who is the only person to talk to when it comes to football finance. From the Price of Football podcast, it's the busiest man in podcasting. It's Kieran Maguire. Kieran, how are you? I'm all tickety-boo. Uh, it's quite nice to uh, appear on a championship show, given that uh, Chelsea aren't very pleased with me at present. I suspect Everton aren't, after what I've just said about their owners. <laughs> and uh, I, I gave a talk to a parliamentary committee about a month ago, and Richard mm. Masters was sat behind me, and I, and I could feel the laser beams on the back of my <laughs> neck as I said, yeah, I don't think the Premier League's doing very much on this, that and the other. Um, but yeah, I'm sure he went back to his £1.9 million a year salary and didn't lose any sleep over yeah. it. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure he'll be fine. You know, it's a nice change of pace for you to be talking about the championship for once, isn't it? I mean, we did speak last year and it feels right to have a sort of annual review of the financial positions of clubs because, as you know very well, Kieran, it's always changing and it's particularly never dull here in the championship, is it? <laughs> yes, it's a, it, it, it's a fascinating division. I think we described it previously as the clown car of European <laughs> football. Um, you, you've got all of those clubs changing position each year. You've got all of those incentives to overspend and not learn any lessons from history, which which is mm. what, what we're quite good at doing on a on a more global basis at present. But let's not go down that particular avenue. <laughs> of course, well, we'll try to cover as many bases as possible, as I say, with different championship clubs. But let's get started with the first club I wanted to ask you about. It's the side who are set to have perhaps the most interesting summer from my perspective. It's the losers of the playoff final, Leeds United. Quite a Bit of business is expected there over the next couple of months, and we will discuss that shortly. But they've been in the news recently for different reasons over the past few weeks. That's because Red Bull have taken a minority ownership stake in Leeds United. Now, we're told they won't be coming RB Leeds or anything like that in the near future. But that aside, how significant is this news, Kieran? I think it's a vote of confidence in Leeds United. And, and the reason why I say that is that, that Red Bull are a global brand. And I think Leeds, was Leeds shirt sponsor this year? Flamingoland. Um, it was the sleeve sponsor. The main sponsor was Box, yes. I think. Yeah. Um, so Leeds will be looking to be the top dogs in the championship, in, certainly in terms of finances. Yeah, we know that they've got magnificent support home and away. But um, they are looking to generate additional income. 49ers investments. I think people get a little bit confused about the owners. It's nothing to do with the 49ers themselves. It's a pure investment arm who are looking for some form of financial return. They had hoped, of course, to have returned to the Premier League for having failed to do so selling off 10% or whatever it is of the club, and we are awaiting those details at present, um, <clears throat> is, is a way of generating short-term cash, which is one thing that they need. And the reason why I say that is that if you took a look at Leeds United's accounts when they were relegated, the big issue for me was that they owed £190 million in unpaid transfer fees, of which... £78 million of that was due by the 30th of June 2024. So, yes, they've got parachute payments, but the parachute payments go to pay wages. Yes, they've sold some players. Yes, they've shifted a lot of players um, in terms of loans. But even so, um, from a cash point of view, I think this would have been beneficial to the club. And uh, I think, you know, I've, I've spoken to Parag, um, who's the... Uh, yeah, the new chief executive and so on. He, he strikes me as somebody who is business smart and uh, is, is using the the connection with Red Bull to 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 help smooth the waters over what could be a bit okay. of a choppy summer overall for, for many, many clubs. 
Yeah, well, that brings me nicely on to the reports that had come out just before the playoff final that if Leeds did lose that playoff final, they would need to raise £100 million from player sales. And of course, they have lost in the playoff final since then. So from what you know, is that the case? And how does the Red Bull deal change that? Well, if we look at those questions in turn, I don't know where this figure of £100 million came from because if, if I, I've got a spreadsheet here in front of me which has got every single club you've heard of and quite a few that you haven't um, in, in terms of their, their their accounts for going back at many, many years. Now, now Leeds lost £70 million in the last two years in the Premier League. Um, you're allowed... Um, for the three years to the 30th of June 2024. Leeds were allowed to lose 83 million. By the time you add back your PSR adjustments, I felt that Leeds could could afford to lose a, a fair amount of money in that first season in the Championship and still be within the boundaries of um, PSR. So do they need to, to raise £100 million to avoid a potential points deduction? No, no, that, that's no way is the case. Do they perhaps need a bit of cash to um, help pay for some of these outstanding transfer instalments? Possibly, but if Red Bull have now put in the cash in terms of provided some funding through a variety of means, and if 49ers have put in some cash as well, then I don't see Leeds in being too, too problematic a position. OK, so that, that's really fascinating because this is something that we've spoken about a lot around the you know, the playoffs that Leeds needed to sell if they didn't lose. And that's what's at stake. So how much do they have to try and raise over this summer? Because £100 million sounds like it's bollocks. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not sure where that came from. It, it, yes, in terms of cash, do they need to, to manage their cash a bit better? Certainly. Um, but they have sold players. They've got instalments coming in and so on. So a, a lot of it's just to do with, with management. We don't know the extent to which players had relegation clauses embedded into their contracts. So the, mm. the impact on the wage bill is uncertain. For, certainly the vibes I'm picking up from social media in terms of Leeds United. Do they expect to sell a player or two? Yes, but that's part of player trading. You know, every, every club does that um i think what's all what's what fans fear is some form of fire sale where you're forced to sell players either a by the 30th of june which is normally for psr purposes i don't see that in the case of leeds united or secondly by the end of the august yeah the, the end of the summer window because you simply want to balance the books overall in which case you're under far less pressure to take a discounted price um, in respect of, of players moving, leaving the club. So I, I think Leeds are in an OK position, which goes against the grain of, of sort of the narrative that's being widely reported. Yeah, well, that's really, really interesting. I mean, it seems pretty likely that they will still sell a couple of big names this summer because they're simply too good for the championship. Yeah. But it doesn't sound like they have to sell, which will be very pleasing news for Leeds fans, won't it? One of the teams coming down to the championship next season is Sheffield United, who are an interesting case because they seem to have been looking for a takeover now for at least two years. Now, there has been rumours of an American consortium in the last couple of months who have shown an interest, but how concerned should we be about them the longer it takes for a takeover to happen? Yeah, this, this, this is a strange one. Um, the current owner, he was in negotiation with a guy from... Nigeria, uh, was it Dozi and Bozi? Yeah. Who, it's something like yeah, that. Yeah, who, who appeared to have aircraft which he bought on Instagram. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's another one of these truly fascinating stories. There, there are so many charlatans, there are so many fantasists involved in the world of trying to become a football club owner. It, it, it seems to be very much unique in. Uh, compared to many other industries. Um, is, is the Sheffield United owner looking at the exit door? Yes. Why has it not happened? Because he's asking for too much money. No, it, it, comes, it comes down to price. 
Um, there are, I can assure you, there are many, many people who want to buy football clubs because my inbox, I, I get fed up of a number of tyre kickers, ne'er-do-wells, wrong-uns, <laughs> who say, oh, Kieran, what do you think about this? And what, can you give us a bit of information about Club X or Club Y? And I just end up giving stuff away for nothing, which, which, which I don't mind doing, but I'm going, I don't think you're going, I don't think you're approaching this from the right point of view. And whilst the EFL come in for a lot of criticism at times, I, I do think, especially under Trevor Birch, that they have really upped their game in terms of protecting clubs from people who you would not want in your village or town, let alone owning your football club. Um, and therefore, it has made it more difficult for deals to go through but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, if, if it protects you from another Chris Kirchner, from another Lawrence Bassini, from another William Story, then um, I think that's in the best interest of football. So from a Sheffield United perspective, go back to the original question, should we be concerned if they don't get a takeover done in, by the end of the year, say? Not this season. I think yeah, that they, can, that they don't have a huge wage bill from what I can gather. I appreciate they sold their two best players when they were promoted. They've got the benefit of parachute payments. They they should have, despite not moving the goalposts very much in terms of generating points last season, they still will have picked up £110 million in, in broadcast revenues. So a need to sell from a financial perspective, I don't think that's the case. A need to sell from the point of view of the club progressing. You've got an owner who is is not interested in the club. is is not interested in um, making the club more attractive on the pitch in in terms of what it can deliver uh, by investing in talent. Then I, th I think a, a sale would be desirable, um, but not essential from a, f a financial perspective. Interesting. Well, if you cast your mind back to the last time we spoke, Kieran, we were very concerned about West Brom, who were kind of in a similar position to Sheffield United, well, an, an even more dire position than Sheffield United are now, it's got to be said, where they desperately needed a takeover. Now that has since happened and the future looks a lot rosier. But my question is, are they completely out of the woods when it comes to financial hurdles? Um. I think they are fine in terms of being able to pay the bills. And that's okay. always important. Um, as far as looking at their, their profitability is concerned, um, this season is their first season without parachute payments. So 23, 24. Um, they had to get the wage bills substantially down this season. We'll, we will find out in due course the extent to which they've been successful at that. Um, the new owner seems a safe pair of hands in the, in the relatively short period of time that uh, we, we've seen in operation to date. So I don't sh see huge issues apart from the fact that, for me, the wage bill is, is looking... Hi, I mean, the wage bill last season, £45 million. West Brom will have generated in 23, 24, somewhere in the region of £25 million. So you're looking at a minus £20 million unless they've made se severe progress in getting that wage bill down. Now, clearly, they, yeah, they were trying to get into the playoffs. They're trying to get promoted. So will the wage bill have been cut significantly? I suspect not. So... We're now sort of looking into the realms of, OK, well, how are they going to fund significant losses? And remember, the average losses in the championship are 20 grand a week, sorry, 40 grand a week. Um, that's either got to come from the owners or player sales. And, and we'll, we'll wait and see in due course what the strategy of the owners are towards uh, West Brom next season. But again, you know, big, heavy hitters as far as the championship are concerned. Intuitively, you'd expect them to be there or thereabouts in terms of playoffs or better. Yeah, very curious. I mean, it is worth saying they have let a lot of players go over the past 
few weeks um, who have been out of contract. So that will ease the wage bill, won't it? But uh, yeah, still a lot, a lot of uh, work to do uh, for West Brom. One rather curious news story we've seen in recent weeks involves Watford. They're offering fans shares in the club in a bid to raise money for transfers. Watford are offering approximately 10% of the club at a value of £17.5 million. Kieran, can you explain this to us as if you're explaining it to a 12-year-old, please? Um, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not very popular at Vicarage Road. Uh, I think it's fair <laughs> to say my assessment has not been glowing. I think what 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 they're trying to do, and let's look at it through through their their eyes. They are fully aware that there are many people in the world, especially in the United States, who have become enchanted by football and want a piece of the action. What Watford are doing is they're saying, well, if you want a piece of the action, we're prepared to give you a piece of the action in the form of shares. And um, the shares are being sold both in the UK and they've, they've sold their full allocation in the UK. They've sold, I think they were trying to raise 17 and a half million of which 2 million was coming from the UK and the rest was coming from the international markets, which I thought was intriguing. Um, they seem to have sold out in the UK. What are you getting in return? If, if 10% of Watford Football Club is worth 17 and a half million pounds, then the value of the club as a whole in terms of the shares is worth 175 million and I'm going for a club in the championship that's mm. that seems high and again no disrespect to Watford you know, I love going to Vicarage Road as an away fan but it, it's not Elland Road it's not it's not going to be if, you know 35 to 40,000 people there every week and if they don't have a good season and they've got Middlesbrough on a Tuesday night then is it going to be full to the rafters if they're 14th and Borough are 11th, I suspect not. Whereas, you know, there are a few clubs that the fans will turn out because it's a religion. You know, that's not a, that's not a criticism of Watford fans. Um, I think, you know, they've got a good core fan base, but the casual punter, and, you know, I'm a Brighton fan. It would be exactly the same if Brighton got relegated and we're in a similar scenario. There will be huge swathes of empty tickets, of empty seats. Um, so upon what basis is it worth, 175 million pounds well Watford said well it's the highest profits ever made in the history of, of the championship and I go in, yep yeah I agree with that but a lot of that was due to the fact that you sold players following relegation yeah. in 22 um, and some of those players you know we normally when you you think about what's happened in the season it's the the summer window before the season starts and the January window during the season that's where most people what Watford did is they sold Jao Petro I mean he was sold in May to Brighton and the deal went through formally when the the transfer market opened at the end of 23 so a player that most fans would have thought was sold in 23-24 was actually being accelerated into 22-23 perfectly legal but you take away those player sales because they, they, they're not going to be selling players and making a £60 million profit every year. You take away that and you go, well, actually, the numbers don't look too good. And then they said, you know, I've looked at the, the sales document as, as, as it is, you know, uh, a record 239% increase in commercial income over five years between 2018 and 2022, the highest in Europe. That's that's a bold claim. It's it's an accurate claim, but if you do the five years from twenty nineteen to twenty twenty three or the seasons, commercial income actually fell. So it was. <laughs> so why isn't this <laughs> being um, being you know included in the in in the sales pitch? Um, so what are you getting for your shares? Well, you're not getting a vote. So normally uh, uh, owning a share is owning yeah, it's owning a fraction of a business. Yeah. So you're not getting any votes with those shares. So the, you know, the owner can go and sell his shares with all the votes to somebody else. Um, you can't sell the shares for at least 12 months. You're not going to get a dividend on the shares. You're not going to get any interest because you don't pay interest on shares. So what have you got? You've got a, you've got a piece of paper which you'll have to print off yourself. 
Um, you do get a digital certificate. Well, that's that's great. Okay, fine. So you can look at it on your phone and say, yeah, I, I now own a fraction of Watford Football Club. Um, there are some perks. Um, so if, for example, you spend £800,000 on buying shares in this offer from Watford Football Club, you get a free scarf, <laughs> home, away and third kits. Okay, so you get three shirts <laughs> and you get free parking. And you get to go to lunch with the manager. And I'm going... So, so what, what you're saying is it, it's essentially a very expensive, like, box at, at Vicarage Road. Well, no, you, you, only get, you only get a box once a season. You only get a chance. Oh, my so, God. So, you know, mm, that... I, know, I know the prices of kits nowadays is outrageous, but yeah. this is taking the piss. Exactly. I mean, if you've got a chance to go to lunch with every manager that Watford had during a season, <laughs> perhaps it's looking slightly better value because, you know, they've, they've got a bit of a track record of not not keeping them for too long. So I just don't see value in in the deal. And, and, I, and I've said that. Um, and I've also said, and I'll say it here, I'm not a financial advisor. Um, and if you were thinking about putting money in, if you want to go and put, you know, buy 50 quid's worth of shares, stick a certificate on the wall and feel slightly warm inside, do it. But just don't expect to see the money again. You know, view, view it as a donation rather than an investment. And that's fine. But if that is the case, you've got to wonder why Watford are having to go through this particular route. You know, why isn't the owner putting in money? Um why aren't they using player sales? Yeah, there's 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 a few there's a few sort of mini red flags that make you feel slightly uncomfortable about the situation. I I, I don't see Watford going into crisis mode at all. You know, certainly not. But it just seems a strange thing to do. But I, I monitor. You know, it has generated not seventeen and a half million pounds, but it's, it's got about four million pounds worth of pledges already because some. Some football fans in the United States will think that this is a great way to own a club back in the UK. I just hope that they've done their homework. But will they? <laughs> yes, the, the silence says everything. Um, let, let, let's move on, Kieran, to Sheffield Wednesday, who are always a fascinating club, aren't they? Mainly because they're owned by an absolute maniac. The latest on them is Depon Chansiri doesn't want to sell reportedly, and would like extra investment from elsewhere. Now, I struggle to see Wednesday really going anywhere while Mr Chancery is in charge of the club here. And is that fair? You never know at a football club. You, know, you get the right manager, you get a couple of decent loan signings, you get good atmosphere in the dressing room, and that can be transformative. So, never say never. But Wednesday certainly don't have one of the biggest budgets as far as the championship is concerned. Um, looking at the way that Dejon Chansiri has owned and run the club, it's been erratic at times when they've announced <laughs> that, the... That feels like it's understating it a bit. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, um, um, we, we, myself and Kevin Day, who I do the podcast with, we uh, we wrote a book called Unfit and Improper Persons. Um, and I did actually send a copy to Mr. Chansiri to say, thank you for the inspiration for writing this book. Didn't get a reply. Disappointed in that, I've got to be honest. Um, but he, he doesn't appear to have a long-term strategy. Um, you know, there were stories around, I think they had a 10-year season ticket or uh, or some sort of some some very strange season ticket sales, yeah. Which which went yeah. up, and you looked at the terms and you say that that does look a bit strange. And I I was told, in respect on one of these, they only sold four of them, of which three were to people called Chansiri. So, um, it it's always uh, you know fr from my point of view, it's sort of trying to analyse the finances. Sheffield Wednesday's always been a bit of a goldmine. 
you know, the, the the sponsorship deal they had with the taxi company that didn't own any taxis and didn't have a phone phone number, I thought was a particular high watermark. Um, <laughs> the, the energy drink company, which didn't appear to be selling any energy drinks, was a, was another one. Both happened to be owned, of course, by Dave, you know, Mr. Chancery himself. So he, he's always been a source of uh, uh, content from my point of view. If I was a Wednesday fan, it was an owl, the joke's worn off. Um, yeah, they did well at the end of the season um, to, to, to keep their position, but it's, it's a frustrating set of circumstances because Sheffield Wednesday is a big club. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a massive, massive club, isn't it? Especially at championship level. And uh, you've got this guy running it who, he, again, from a content perspective, it's great for us. But uh, <laughs> from a Wednesday perspective, I imagine it's pretty annoying. Um, a, a club who seems to be having a bit of a crisis behind the scenes right now is Blackburn Rovers. I've recently been seeing constant reports of staff members leaving. And there have been concerns this year about how the owners, the Venkies, will fund the club going forwards. What's your take on them, Kieran? Should we be concerned about them? I'm, I'm a little bit twitchy about Blackburn. Um, trying to work out the mentality of the Venky family towards Blackburn Rovers has been a real struggle. Um, I don't think they've attended any matches since a fan threw a snowball at one of the Venkies. And this was probably about in 2013. So they've not attended the matches. They have provided funding. Yeah, they have provided millions of pounds of funding. And um, like you, I've got contacts at clubs and local newspapers and so on. And, and my secret rover says they have been incredibly generous. Yeah, they, they've put in the thick end of 200 million pounds into Blackburn Rovers. Trying to work out what they're going to get from it in return is difficult. And now that they have had issues with the Indian government with regards to tax considerations, I think which involved buying Gary Neville's old house. You know, it's one of these sort of weird yeah. stories yeah. Um, because they're only allowed to spend money on sort of business uh, deals. And uh, isn't Gary Neville's house sort of Teletubby friendly, or was that Phil's? I don't know. Some some sort of really <laughs> weird thing. Um, I think potentially broke broke the rules. I, I don't know enough about how the tax system works in India. I would imagine that it will be quite bureaucratic, uh, and um, this could have an impact upon their ability to maintain that level of funding. And that's that's my concern. Um, that if there are constraints put on them with regards to how they use their money by the Indian government, by the Indian tax authorities, then we've got a problem because Blackburn, in its present form, is losing money uh, you know, on, on a month-by-month -month basis. As I was saying to you earlier, right, it, it happens in the championship. You know, it's, uh, it, it's the nature of the division. Yeah, it really is. Um, one club who doesn't seem to have a problem with funding the issue being that they can't actually spend the money, is Stoke City. And that, that is the case, isn't it, Kieran? They, they have some of the richest owners in the championship, but just can't do anything with that money, can they? Well, they can't spend it well. I mean, that's <laughs> There's also that's, that. that's the issue. Um, they were in a slight pickle a few years ago with relation to uh, financial fair play, PSR, whatever you want to call it. But fortunately, they found somebody who was willing to buy the Bet365 Stadium from them at a really good price. And, and that, that was Bet365, who also happens to be the, the common owners of Stoke City Football Club, where, where all of their, their potential revenue or potential investment comes from. They are very much a, for want of a word, a, you know, a, a victim of FFP. Um, I think their is it Tony Scholes, who was their previous chief executive, he certainly bemoaned on more than one occasion that why can't the owners put put in the money? Yeah, they, they've rinsed punters for it. They don't they don't know what to do with it. If you, if you take a look at um, Nicola Coates, who is the uh, the chief executive, she's got the highest salary from Bet Three Six Five of of any. Uh, salaried person in the UK. Yeah, she's making £300 million a year from Bet365 and is taking 
dividends, which will take that closer to 400 million. So yeah, the money is there, the support for the club is there because the Coates family are completely wedded to the idea of, of supporting the local football club. You know, they're from that area themselves, but they are very much constrained by the, the nature of FFP, which only allows an owner in the championship to put in 24 million pounds over a rolling three year period into the club for FFP purposes. This may be a bit of a dramatic example, but are they kind of like a championship version of Newcastle United in the way that they have so much money, but because of the rules, they just can't spend it? They, they yes, well, they they can spend up to an agreed limit, and yeah, you know some of the things that Stoke do in, in terms of you know very competitive ticket prices free travel at times for away fan, you know, for fans to go to away matches. Some of the stuff they do and the work that they've done in the communities is absolutely magnificent. Um, but they are in a similar position at Newcastle is that they cannot spend the sums that they would like to spend in order to make themselves competitive in, in terms of you know, a playoff. Having said that, you know, again, you know, Stoke's a, a decent-sized club. You, you, you'll be surprised that it's not really bothered the scorers since being relegated from the Premier League. Yeah, was it five, six years ago? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, they've certainly not been doing that considering they finished between 14th and 17th every season since being relegated. So, uh, yeah, whether that's going to change anytime soon, only time will tell. Um, Kieran, let's round off this chat with two of my favourite questions whenever I chat to you, because um, this is always interesting. Um, the first question we'll ask, um, we'll, we'll start off with a negative one, shall we? Who is the club who you have the most concern for in the Championship? Could be someone we've spoken about here, maybe someone we haven't spoken about yet. Um, it's, always a, it's always a difficult one. I'm just going to go to yet another one of my, my spreadsheets that I've got in front of me. But Looking at the clubs that I've got here, um, there's none which are terrifying. Yeah, I, I would have been concerned about Huddersfield, but they've been relegated to League One. Um, I'm, I would have been concerned about Blackpool, but they're in League One. I, I think I'm, I'm nervous about Watford in the sense that why are they going through this particular route? But as far as the others, I'm looking at the full list here. Um, again, you know, Reading looks like you know they're coming through the other through the other side. Luton have just been relegated. You know, Luton are in a very strong position financially. I, I don't see what I would refer to as as a basket case as far as the the championship is concerned. In in the same way that I was concerned perhaps one or two years ago, and that was mainly due to the owners. Whilst you know, Mr. Chancery is a figure of fun. Um, because of the wealth of his family, ultimately, when when money needs to be found, it is found, even though it's sometimes seems to go through a somewhat strange route. Uh, so, I, I don't. I honestly don't think that there is a a problem child as far as the championship is concerned, and and that's nice to be able to say. And and yet I'm saying that in in the context of. Average losses of four hundred thousand pounds a week. So, so my concern would be if we had this conversation in three three months' time, and you know, you know, and, you know we we wouldn't wish this upon anybody because we you know we've, we've lost some people in terms of good owners such as John Berrelson at Millwall, for example, over the course of the last twelve months. If if an owner was to go and the club was being subsidised to a huge extent, then we've got a problem. And that's when you do any form of analysis. You say, well, the club's fine. But, provided that owner is still willing to put in somewhere between 10 and 20 million pounds a year. I mean, that's phenomenal, isn't it? Because I don't think we've ever been in a position before where we haven't had at least one club who you look at and makes you raise your eyebrows quite significantly because, I mean, it was Reading Monte a few yeah. years ago who had that wage bill, which was four times the amount of the income they were getting or something like that anyway. Um, then, of course, we've had Derby, Sheffield Wednesday, Villa, West Brom West in more Brom. recent yeah, yeah. times. So, yeah, it's good that we've actually got to a position now where there isn't anyone who's in a really dreadful place, but there's still a couple who you would obviously put yeah. a 
question marks yeah. next to, isn't there? Um, let's finish it on a positive then, Kieran. Who is the best run club in the championship? Um, I would say Luton Town. As far as I thought, you may say that. I was going to add a pref- I was going to add on to the end of that question, ignoring Luton Town. Ignoring Luton Town. <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, in which case, I'd probably go and look at, say, Norwich. I, I think that they are okay. professional in the way that they're run. I might have said Ipswich Town had they not been promoted, uh, mm. but Norwich, safe pair of hands. They've got a good close links with the community. Um, the pricing structure is right. When I've met some of of their staff, I, I've been imp- I've been impressed with their level of professionalism. So, you know, as as a club which is a, a textbook yo yo club, I, I would say that they are probably the best. Uh, they they've not overextended themselves when they've been promoted to the Premier League, and when they come back to the Championship, they've always tended to be in that top eight, you know, going for, for top six as well. Yeah, interesting. And we probably should give some credit to Luton Town because there'll be some Luton fans who are listening to this thinking, oh, we were just about to get two minutes worth of praise and I've cut them I cut them off at the kneecap. Um, so with that being said, are Luton Town the model football club for plenty of sides in the EFL? Well, yes. I, mean, I think you've only got to look at their history. You know, anybody that still has, even a modicum of romance with regards to the way that they think of the game. For, for Luton to have come the route that they've done without spending large sums of money, with having Kenilworth Road as a, a, a small stadium with very limited ability to generate additional revenues on match days, to, to generate money from hospitality and so on, I think it is a testament to, to Gary Sweet and his team um, of having a vision, having a strategy, sticking to it and reaping the rewards uh, and a fair play to them for that. Yeah, absolutely. I remember watching them when they were playing Southport in non-league and to see them in the Premier League last season was just ridiculous. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see this coming season how they bounce back, but because they're so well run, you would not rule it out at all, would you? Kieran, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you today. As usual, where can people find you um, if they want to listen to more of your podcast? Um, well, I do this podcast called The Price of Football with uh, comedy writer, comedian and all-round good guy, I've got to be said, uh, Kevin Day. We, we do that two or three times a week. So we, we have a question show each week. We have a, a news show each week. And I always think, there's never going to be any news, but the, the Premier League or the EFL or the National League or the SPFL or <laughs> Gianni Infantino always come to my rescue <laughs> with content. Um, and recently spoken to to Trevor Birch. Um, he's, he's, he's a friend of the show. Um, we have regular communication through WhatsApp messages and grumpy calls because we're, we're both uh, ex-accountants who have ended up somehow vaguely connected in my case, but very closely connected in his place with the football industry. I've got huge admiration for, for him as a, as a professional. You know, he's, he's, he's very thorough. He's, he's very organised. He, 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 he is... He's been a professional footballer. He's been the chief executive of a football club. He's run football clubs that have gone bust. And now he's in charge of the EFL. I I think he does a fantastic job. And I've been very impressed with uh, his team as well. Uh, Can he he sort out the mess? Uh, No, he can't. Nobody can. But at least he can stop some of the crazy people from making it worse. Yeah, absolutely. That's all he can really do, isn't it? Um, Kieran, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ryan. Keep up the great work. This is... Oh, thank you. This has been the Second Tier Podcast. I've been Ryan Dilks. We'll be back again on Thursday for a news roundup of everything going on in the Championship.